Okay, so like I said, I was going to interrupt you uh, just for a little bit because I want to show you this thing about ZDEF. The Photoshop stuff, if you've taken 135, you're pretty comfortable with how you collage and, and whatever. And the truth of uh, the speed of, of working on a rendering, uh, if I were to do this rendering, it would take a long time to accurately render all the ground and the grass and, and whatever. Um, the easiest thing to do is find a hillside in Photoshop, collage it in, do a little grass brush, call it a day. Um, it, it saves a bunch of time in the long run rather than actually rendering everything out. But what I do want to show you today is something that's built in. Uh, it used to be called channels, but it's no longer called channels. Um, it's, and we've mentioned it a little bit before, but if I go into my V-Ray asset editor, I open the settings and I open the drawer to the right side here, uh, I have something called render elements that I can open up. And I mentioned this before, but essentially we can go through and we can do a background, a material ID, an object ID, shadows, and something called Z-Depth. And the Z-Depth, uh, I haven't ever explained what it was for, and I think it's one of those last little nuggets that if you take it away and can use it down the road, it's going to improve your renderings quite a lot. Um, so Z-Depth is a little more involved than just turning it on, though. We have to actually set it up for the particular camera that we're looking at. And so in the case uh, of the one that I picked, I picked this exterior render 3 as my rendering that I want to set up the Z-Depth for. So what I need to do is I need to find out the distance from this camera to the near focal point and the far fo focal point in, in a rendering. So how close is the nearest object? How far away is the furthest object? And I'm going to do that by um, clicking the little downward triangle here and going to set camera and then show camera. I can then jump out of the exterior render 3 view and into the top view where I can see the camera and I can measure some distances. So if I turn on my endpoint snap and my point snap, uh, I can then type in distance, and I'm going to measure the units from the camera to wherever the closest point on my object is. So the closest point is right about there on my object. Now, I've screwed up and my units are in millimeters, so it's going to give me a really large number. Usually your units should be in inches, in which case this wouldn't be a problem. I get uh, 10,171. So this is my near point. So in my V-Ray uh, asset editor here, when I include Z-Depth as one of the channels, and I would do that by typing here or selecting Z-Depth right there, I'm going to open and expand the Z-Depth, and right here under Near Distance, I'm going to put in that number, 10,171. Then I'm going to get to the far distance. So once again, I'll come back to my Rhino file here. I'm going to measure the distance from this point to wherever the furthest point is that I may want to have in focus. So it's probably the furthest point of your model. It might be a little bit further. It's okay if it's a little bit further. We'll say something like that. This is 34,913. So I'll type right in here, 34,913. So like I said, your numbers will be less because your units will be in inches. That was a mistake when I first set up my file, but I'd mess up my views if I switch it right now. So I'm going to go with it. So I set those values up in Z-Depth. Now I'm going to go back to my exterior render 3 view and go ahead and start the render. So I'll click on the render button and we'll start the render. Uh, it's going to have to run for a little bit. I don't need the highest quality output for what I'm going to show you guys, uh, but I would like to get through maybe the first or second pass of the rendering. So bear with me for a second while this, uh, this comes out. It's always so painful to wait. I can tell in this rendering already that I'm missing a few materials, like I'm missing the, the pavers here showing up as white, the wood on these posts is missing. So I've got some file issues that, that probably should be resolved, but uh, it's not going to affect what I'm going to show you today. 
So we'll see if I can switch over to show you the Z depth right now. So the channels or the, um, what are they called again? The render, render elements. I've got to get used to the new terms since they change what they're called. The render elements you can view in this little drop down menu. I have the RGB color version showing, but if I switch to the alpha, it's going to show me what is transparent and how transparent it is. If I switch to the shadows, it's going to show me only the shadows that are being cast. If I switch to the material ID, it's going to make a color for every material that I've used in my scene, which is really useful for Photoshop. You can do a select by color range to select certain sections of your file. Then I have object ID. This is where we're supposed to get a separate color for every uh, individual object in the scene. Background is giving me just the background, just the sky. And then finally, I have Z-Depth. And what Z-Depth does is it creates a spectrum from white to black, white being closest to you, black being furthest away from you. So it's essentially a gradient. And it looks at all the objects, it looks at the distance from the camera, and sets the closest point to pure white. So that closest point that I picked was right about here. The furthest point that I picked was off here, kind of in the distance. And so we're going from pure white here to ultimately black and everything black. If I set those values tighter, uh, more of the building would be black. So right now you're saying, okay, that's great, but what on earth does that do for me? Well, I'm going to show you what that does for you in a little bit. I just need it to finish uh, a version of this. This is probably good enough. Now yeah, we'll let it run for a little bit longer. I'll tell you what, I'll pause for about five minutes or so, let it run so we get a higher quality rendering. Then I'll show you the Photoshop side uh, of the collage. Okay, so I'm going to continue on. I think it's rendered far enough for me to get the, uh, the point across of, of Z-Depth. So I'm going to make sure that I save all the channels. So I'm going to click and hold on the disk and make sure it goes to the one with the multiple disks on it. Uh, with that one selected, I'll click on the button and I'm going to save JPEGs. I'm not going to use PNGs because I don't want to preserve the transparency. Uh, I already have actually saved them under this perspective too. I'll delete that. And then we'll go ahead and resave them. So I'll click save. It'll ask me, do I want to replace it? I'll say yes. And that will replace all those channels. The, the advantage is that, of course, all the channels are saved for me. I'll let this rendering keep running. Uh, and furthermore, if I let it keep running, I could slip in the, uh, the, new, the, uh, the higher quality rendering later on. So it's kind of a nice triage method here. So in Photoshop, I'm going to go to File and then Open. And I'll open up that uh, the base color rendering. So this one right here. And with that one open, I'm going to right click on the background and say layer from background. And that gives me uh, a live layer that I can work on. And I'm going to create a second copy of the same layer. So I'll right click on the layer and say duplicate layer. Oops. And of course, it doesn't want to let me do it. There it is. I just couldn't see it. So we'll just make it the layer zero copy. I'm also, in, I'm not going to place the next image. I'm going to go to file and then open, and I'm going to open up that Z depth here. And so it'll open. And so this is, like I said, white is the closest to me. Black is the furthest away from me. I'm going to copy this whole thing. So I'll go to edit, um, select all, or press control A on the keyboard. There we go and then go to edit copy. And then I'm going to jump back to this file where I had my, my image with both layers, duplicates of each other. And on the uppermost layer, I want to create a layer mask. So I'll click on the add layer mask button. So I get a layer mask for that layer only. Then I want to copy this Z depth onto the mask for this layer. So I want to copy it right here. So to do that, I have to jump to the channels select the mask, and then I can uh, control V or edit paste to drop that mask in. I'll go back to layers and you can see it now shows up as a mask on that layer. Still nothing has actually happened. So what I have is I have the Z depth as a uh, mask on top of a copy of my original drawing of my original render. 
Now here's where the magic happens. So I'll go ahead and deselect so nothing selected and I'm going to go up to my filter. Sorry, I have to be on, apologize, I have to be on the layer uh, that has the mask on it. Then I'm going to go up to filter. I'm going to go to blur and I'm going to choose something called lens blur. And so when I choose lens blur, over here on the right side in the options, under the depth map, instead of source as none, I'm going to choose the source as the layer mask. And now that I have that, when I click, so let's say I click this near point, that will be in focus and the back of my image will go out of focus. I can click this face and that will be in focus. The What's closer to me will be out of focus and what's further away will be out of focus. So I can essentially choose whatever point, even if it's way far away back up here in the hillside, whatever point in this image I want to have in focus, I can choose. So it's a, it's a way of adding a depth to your image, a photorealism to your image uh, that you wouldn't otherwise have. And it can really help you to blur out parts of the background or parts of the foreground in this whole compositional strategy. So like in the background here, the grass doesn't matter anymore because it's now blurred out, for example. All I'm concentrating on is what's closer in. You can choose uh, how much, so I can choose where the, the blur is, but I can also choose how much the blur is or how blurry it gets by changing this radius so you can see in this case, this is almost like uh, doing a tilt shift lens where I can choose one little piece to be in focus and the rest of it's out of focus. It's almost as if I was photographing a little tiny model. So it's just another strategy for getting different rendering uh, outputs out. And it's really pretty darn easy to set this up in Photoshop. All you need is that Z-depth mask, which is why it's important to think about it. The one thing that I will point out about the Z-depth is that the Z depth is always tied to the camera that you're rendering in. So if we jump back into V-Ray here, the Z depth is tied specifically for this camera view. I would need to go in and I would need to change these two values if I change the camera. You can put in generic values that are close, like these values actually are probably fairly close to all the views that I have and I could re-render each time and, and I could still probably use them, but you want to pay attention to that camera view. Uh, going forward. So, like I said, I didn't want to talk too much today, but I wanted to point this out as a strategy uh, to kind of change and, and enhance your renderings. I know it involves Photoshop, which is not part of the student learning outcomes for this class. I'm not really supposed to talk about it, but it's kind of, it's too good not to at least mention that you can use it. All the other strategies still work, all the other channels still work, etc. We can always come back and use this over the top of a Photoshopped image um, knowing, knowing kind of where we are in that particular image. And like I said, I can move around. Uh, and I think when you do this live for yourself, you really start to understand what, what, it's, what it can do and what you can do uh, with it. Okay, so I'll, I'll be quiet now. I'll let you guys work. Um, please post some kind of a work in progress today. So I get a post for uh, exercise 229. I will check that off. I'm also going to come around and hand out the current grade sheets. This will be your last grade sheet that you get for the class um, next week. Just as a reminder, on Monday the 9th, everything's due. So you'll turn everything in. I bought donuts today. Uh, well, I didn't buy them. <laughs> I paid for them today to be made and ready fresh for you on Monday. Uh, so I'll come in with all the donuts. I will have a, um, a couple... Uh, a handout with a link to an online survey. For those of you that have taken my class in 135 before, you know I do this at the end of the semester. Uh, I'm going to ask you to fill out that survey and let me know what you liked about the class, what you didn't like about the class, what worked, what didn't, what needs improvement, that sort of thing. It really helps me tailor the class and, and customize it for the next classes, uh, etc. So I'll ask you some targeted questions on that. You'll spend a little bit of time filling that out. Uh, you'll turn in your images. We'll put them in stacks on the back table. Remember, you're giving me print versions as well as posting the images online. I will grade the online versions, not the print versions, but I like kind of having an 11 by 17 book at the end of each semester that shows what all the renderings were. Um, so I'm going to have you guys do those 11 by 17s. You'll put those on the back. Um, on Wednesday, you will have to come here and check in with me. So you come here as normal, normal time, come in, say hi, 
so there'll be a sign-in sheet. You'll sign your name on the sheet saying you were here, and then you're free to go study or do whatever you need to do. But I'm required to have you actually physically come that day and grade you for being here that day. Uh, so that's how the semester plays out. Those are the last two days. Please, please remember to turn in what I ask for in the final. Uh, all too often, people turn in the wrong thing, or they give me, you know, uh, two interior renderings, but both of them are night renderings. And I'm relatively loose. Like, I could probably count a sunset rendering for a day rendering or a night rendering. Like, I try to be loose. But if you give me two night renderings for an interior, you're missing one of the requirements for the class. And this is, you'll see on the grade sheets, if you didn't do well on 204, it's because you didn't give me what I asked you for. You, you know, like you, I asked you for a day and a night of each fixture. You gave me a day but not a night or something like that. You just lose huge chunks of points. So please make sure you give me what I'm asking for. Okay, that's the last time I'll remind you uh, of it. Okay, so I'll come around with these. Let me know if you have any questions or need any help. Other than that, I'll be quiet so you guys can work.